subhanahu wa ta'ala if it in and if it includes the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that sin cannot be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until you settle it within your own selves. Until you settle it within your own selves. That is why these kind of things, when it comes to social obligations, commitments, and trusts, it's not, it's not, it's not an easy task. It's not a light task. It's significant, it's immense, especially in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because however much you repent back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will not be forgiven unless you settle the scores against the one, with the one whom you acted against, whom you oppressed, whose trust you broke, whose commitment you did not fulfill, etc., etc. The second hadith is the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, anhu, hadith 1585. Narrated by Ibn Mas'ud and Ibn Umar and Anas. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with the, them all. Qalu, they said, Qala al-Nabiyyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لِكُلِّ غَادِرٍ لِوَاءٌ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يُقَالُ هَذِهِ غَدْرَةُ فُلَانِ هَذِهِ غَدْرَةُ فُلَانِ مُتَفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ Agreed upon by both Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim. An authentic hadith. Ibn Mas'ud and Ibn Umar, both of them narrate. Rather, even Anas, عنهم, three companions of the Prophet وسلم, narrated this. When you come across a hadith whereby more than one companion is narrating it, then that's a very, very strong hadith. A very strong hadith. Anyhow, وسلم, the Prophet وسلم, said, لكل غادر, For every treacherer, for every betrayer, a ghadir is one who breaks another's trust, the doer of the act. لكل غادر لواء يوم القيامة for him will be a flag on the day of قيامة you call it will be said it will be made known it will be proclaimed it will be announced in front of everyone هذه غدرة فلان هذه غدرة فلان this is the betrayal of so and so this is the treachery of so and so سبحان الله I will read the next hadith because it's almost the same with additional wordings and then explain both of them at once. So the next hadith is narrated by Abu Sa'id al Khudri, رضي الله تعالى عنه, أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال, hadith number 1586. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, لكل غادر لواء for every betrayer, for every treacherer will be a flag that he will bear, that he will have to carry. Where in the istihi? Behind his back. يوم القيامة, on the day of قيامة. يرفع له بقدر غدره. It will be raised, it will be elevated based on the nature of his breach. Based on the intensity of his breach. How bad his treachery was. ألا, then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, listen out, behold, ولا غادر أعظم غدرا من أمير عامة. And there isn't a greater betrayal and treachery than the ruler who does not fulfill his commitment. In other words, the greatest treachery is a person in authority who does not fulfill his commitment and breaks his promise. Allahu Akbar. This is the greatest form of treachery. Now let's understand this hadith. The scholars of hadith have got multiple explanations to this hadith. Some of them say it was the practice among the people in Jahiliya, the pre-Islamic era, that when they would come to the marketplaces, the bazaars, the marketplaces, in our times, you could say the supermarkets, okay, you could say places whereby business transactions takes place, you know, supermarkets, shops, stalls, etc., the marketplace, where buying and selling takes place. And they would know of a, someone who was a treacherer, a person who was a betrayer in his transactions, they would raise a flag behind or outside his shop or outside his stall, and they would say, this is the worst of people. This guy is a treacherer. You should be careful. And if a person was honest, then there would be a different form of a flag that would describe his honesty. So this would grant mileage to the sellers. And buyers would want to go to the person who is honest, a person who always fulfills his commitment. So in line with this act, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically will punish the person 
on the day of Qiyamah with a flag that will be tied to his back and based on the intensity proportional to how bad his or her treachery was, that's how the height and the length and the alleviation of and the elevation, sorry, and the elevation of the flag would be. Now, why is this and how is this a punishment? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is exposing him in front of the entirety of humanity on the day of Qiyamah, he will be exposed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this person was a treacherer. He never fulfilled his commitment. He never lived up to his word. You got to know him. Let him, him be known in front of everyone. And they cannot be a greater, a greater punishment than that. Because if everyone gets to know of your evil, that's how intense the punishment would be. And then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned something interesting towards the end of the hadith. He says, "Wala ghadira a'zamu ghadran min amiri amma." The greatest form of treachery, of betrayal, is the betrayal that comes from the one in authority, amiri amma, the general leader and the ruler, public ruler. Allahu akbar. Why? Why did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say that this is the greatest form of treachery? Ask yourself this question. Give yourself a few seconds to think about this. Why? You know why, dear sisters and mothers, and my grandmothers. May Allah subhanahu wa taala bless you all, and may Allah subhanahu wa taala protect us from falling under this grave, enormous sin. It is because a normal person can have a reason. To break one's trust. So you entrust me with something. With an amount. Okay. And I breach the trust. Because I needed the money. I was in a desperate situation. Okay. So I have a genuine excuse. But it doesn't mean. That the trust is forgiven. I will have to make up for that. I will have to compensate for that. Unless the owner overlooks it, that's something else, writes it off, that's something else. But it is a breach of trust, even if I have a genuine reason. For example, a commitment that I have to fulfill, a promise that I made that I have to live up to. There could be a genuine reason behind why it did not take place. There was a need, there was an urgency, there was an emergency, whatever, etc., etc. But when it comes to one who is in authority, especially the head, the ruler, the king. There isn't any genuine reason acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for him to betray the people's trust. Speaking about money, need, he doesn't need that. He can never find himself in need because the entire treasury is in his hands. All the wealth is in, is in, is in his hands. So when he promises the people a project, when he says this will happen, the roads will be made, the taxes will be utilized, corruption will be curbed, etc., etc., etc. People will be put to task, accountability measures will be, play, will be put in place. And then he does not fulfill that. Why did he not fulfill it? Was there anyone who was threatening him? He's the general ruler. He's the head of heads. He's the president. He's the king. Who can dare threaten him? So there's no threat that can work against him. So he had the authority, he had the wealth, he had the execution mechanisms, he had the manpower, he had every possible tool, mechanism, apparatus at his disposal. Yet he breached people's trust. This is the greatest form of betrayal. And isn't this, dear sisters, the very same thing that we are suffering in Kenya? It's very important for us to apply these hadith to our times, to make them relevant. Or else there's no benefit in studying the Holy Quran. There's no benefit in studying the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If there's no relevance to it. If we do not apply this hadith, we do not give it modern applications, then we are not, we are not understanding. We are not studying the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's textbook fiqh. That's textbook hadith. Anyone can read that. We have to give it relevance. We have to tie it to the times that we're living in order for it to have relevance, in order for us to be able to apply it. And as a teacher, I always love to give it relevance, always to tie it to the modern era that we're living, for it to be applicable. 
This is exactly what we're suffering as Kenyans. This is what the younger generation is calling out for. That the president is going around making so many promises, X, Y, and Z, but these promises are not being fulfilled. What is the reason for these promises not being fulfilled? The budget was approved. This happened, that happened. Where is the money gone? Did anyone threaten you? And you did not fulfill the promise? You didn't fulfill the commitment? The Prophet says, there cannot be a greater breach of trust, a greater betrayal than the betrayal of one who is in authority, a ruler, a president, a king, etc. Extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. We move to the last hadith in the chapter before we move on to the next chapter. Hadith number 1587. Abu Murayr narrates. On the authority of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he says, "Qal Allah Taala, Allahu Akbar." When you study hadith, when you read the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and you come across this statement, "Qal Allah Taala," which statement? "Qal al Nabiyyu sallallahu alaihi wasallam." "Qal Allah Taala." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "What does he say?" Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, meaning when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is narrating directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is what is known as hadith al-Qudsi, a divine hadith, al-hadith al-Qudsi, divine hadith. What's the difference between divine hadith al-Qudsi, al-hadith al-Qudsi and the Qur'an? The Qur'an are the spoken words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The meanings are from Allah. The words itself was spoken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for hadith al-Qudsi, the meaning is from Allah. But the wordings and the choice of words, the physiology is from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. So this is a hadith al-Qudsi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Qala Allah ta'ala, Allah the exalted says, ثَلَاثَةٌ أَنَا خَصْمُهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ On the day of Qiyamah, there will be three times of people that I will oppose, I will stand against, I will be their rival, I will contend against them. I will be their rival. Khasm is when you're fighting someone in a ring, in a boxing ring, in a wrestling match, and you have someone whom you're fighting, that's the opposition. That is your rival. That's your opponent. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, three types of people, I will be their opponent, meaning in a battle. And if you're going to have a battle against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes your opponent, meaning stands against you, he's not for you, but against you, khalas, you're gone, you're finished, done. Game over. These three types of people, whom are they? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, رَجُلٌ أَعْطَى بِي ثُمَّ غَدَرٌ A man who makes a commitment on my name, on the strength of my name, and then he doesn't live up to it. He doesn't fulfill that promise. So he makes a covenant, makes a commitment, and uses my name on the strength of my name. By Allah, I will give you this. By Allah, I will do this. Are you going to fulfill your end of the bargain? Wallahi, I will. So you use the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one, that's the first type of a person. The second type of a person, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Allah says rather, وَرَجُلٌ بَاعَ حُرًّا فَأَكَلَ ثَمَنَهُ A person who sells a free man, he sells him into slavery. He's a free man. He sells him into slavery, uh, into slavery and he eats his value, his price. He devours his price. That's the second type of person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will oppose, will fight against. A person who hires, employs a worker, uses the services of a worker. He makes him work, takes exactly what he wants from him, Okay, fulfills his want from him, meaning, meaning he makes him work, he takes his full work from him, uses his services, then at the end of the day, he doesn't pay him. He runs away with his wages. He doesn't pay him. Three types of people. Okay, let's understand this hadith to begin with. 
So the first part of this hadith is basically Mahallu Shahid is the key point, is what we deduce the chapter from. The prohibition of ghadr. Rajulun a'tabi thumma ghadr. A person who takes my name, in my name, he makes a promise, he makes a commitment, but then does not fulfill it. Very dangerous, extremely dangerous. It highlights the importance of fulfilling the promise, especially when someone gave that promise in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Why is it a compounded sin? It's not, it's not a it's not a simple sin. It's not an ordinary sin, it's a compounded sin. Why? Because number one, it consists of breaching a trust, breaking one's trust, not fulfilling the commitment. It's ghadr. Secondly, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is also a disgrace to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name. You dishonored Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name. You made it look like that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is part of the problem itself. So that's a major sin. Number two, a person who sold, sold a free man into slavery and he devoured his value, his price. Now this used to happen at the times of Jahiriya. It used to happen. Very commonly at the times of Jahiliyyah. We don't have slavery in our times, but at the time in the pre-Islamic era and the earlier stages of Islam, there was a society and a concept of slavery, right? And people would be shackled by force and sold into slavery. A very good example is the example of Zayd bin Haritha, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, this great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How great he is the only companion who has been mentioned in the Holy Quran by name. Only companion mentioned by name in Surah Al-Ahzab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes the name of Zayd explicitly. He is the only Sahaba companion in the Holy Quran mentioned by name. Because of him, verses and ahkam rulings were revealed upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This man originally was a free man, his great companion. He was a free man. He was born into an Arab tribe, Banu Kalb, a great, significant, well-respected Arabian tribe. What happened when he was young? He was captured. There was a raid. A tribe raided their tribe. They captured him, subsequently sold, sold him into slavery. He was bought by a man known as Hakim ibn Hizam, the nephew of the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khadija bint Khuwaylid. But at that time, she was not yet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's wife. Radiyallahu anha. So it was given, he was given to Khadija as a servant. Subhanallah, look at this. When Khadija married the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she gifted Zayd bin Haritha to him. A lovely young lad. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam treated him like his own son. Brought him up like his own son. Adopted him like his own son. He was his own son. Until people started calling him Zayd bin Muhammad. Zayd the son of Muhammad. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses. Call them by the names of their fathers. When you assign their fathers, the name of their fathers, then make mention of their original biological fathers. So don't call him Zayd ibn Muhammad. You know his biological father. He's Zayd bin Haritha. So then his original name was restored. Nonetheless, the Prophet ﷺ was a father to him, was a brother to him, was a friend to him, was a confidant to him, was everything to him. Zayd and his father came to know that he is under a man in Medina who proclaims prophecy. So he traveled all the way to Medina, got to Medina, asked about the man who proclaims prophecy, and it is indicated to him, you will meet him at the masjid. He comes to the masjid, asks for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam makes an appearance. He says, who are you? He says, I am the father of Zayd. And with me is the uncle, Ammu Zayd. And I have heard that he is under your shelter. I request to have him back. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you are his father, biological father. No worries. If your claim is true, Zayd bin Haritha approves of that. Feel free to take him and go with him. The Prophet ﷺ called Zayd bin Haritha. Ya Zayd, come here. 
So he comes. He said, do you recognize this man? He said, yes, this is my father, my biological father. Who is this other man? He says, this is my uncle, Ya, ya Rasulullah Ammi. He is my paternal uncle. The Prophet Sallallahu says, you're free to go, Zaid. We have come to ask for you, go. Zaid radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, I am not leaving your company. He looks at his father and he sings couplets of poetry, absolutely emotional, beautiful couplets of poetry. I will just give you a summary of it in summation. He said, you're my beloved father, you're my beloved uncle, I love you to bits. But my prophet, my Nabi, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, is not only my father, he's my brother, he's my friend, he's my confidant, he's my everything. Think I cannot give up his companionship just in order to go back to your home. Dear father, you can go back home. I love you to bits, but I love the Prophet وسلم, even more. You know where I am? We will always visit each other. So Zayd bin Haritha, this was his case. They used to do that. So such kind of people, this Islam came to banish and abolish this practice. The last point. رَجْلٌ إِسْتَأْجَرَ أَجِيرًا A person who hires a worker. Okay? And takes full work from him. Makes him do exactly what he wants. And then he doesn't pay him his wages. Allahu Akbar. This is a serious sin. And it's very, very common. You will get someone to do the work. Either it is a salary or it's a day's job. And you have agreed on an amount. Once the job is done, you start looking for excuses. No, you have not done this right. You have not done this right. Oh, fine. Okay, he's not done that. Right. Make him do the job right. But at the end of the day, make sure that you pay him before his sweat dries. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. Pay the worker before his sweat dries. Meaning don't delay his payment. When it came to you demanding your right, you demanded it in full. When it came to you executing your right, you fell short and you should change the person. This is basically the concept of tatfif mentioned in the Holy Quran. Absolutely dangerous. Absolutely dangerous. This is basically known as the sin of using people. And understand this, my beloved mothers, grandmothers and sisters, the sin of using people. This is a concept that has been proliferated in the times that we live in. You have people who just use people just for the sake of it because they're there. A person is desperate for a job. He doesn't have a job. Okay, you will tell him, okay, fine, come and work for me for one month. Come and work for me for the probation period. What are you going to pay me in the probation period? I'm going to pay you nothing. You're desperate. You want the experience. So you take out work from him. You utilize his experience. He's there. He's a handyman. Khalas. This happens in the medical industry at a very large scale. It's a very large scale. It happens in the in the business industry. It happens in in every industry. Exploitation at the highest level. Fine, he has agreed. Come on, man. There's got to be some humanity behind it. A person you use his experience, you use everything. You wouldn't even pay him a dime. Absolutely unacceptable. Unacceptable. So we use and we abuse, we exploit, and we think that you will walk away with it. This is the sin of tatfif. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَا يَظُنُّ أُولَٰئِكَ أَنَّهُمْ مَبْعُوثُونَ لِيَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ People think that they will get away with it. Fine, you will get away with it, with him. You have taken away his sweat. You have used him, abused him, exploited him, not paid him. Dumped him after two months after you used him. Khalas. You got your work done. You got your job done. Put him on a probation period. Got your job done. Fired him off. Okay. Hurt him. He cries. He sheds tears. Whom can he run to? No one. The authority, you have them in your hands. You will bribe them. You're well connected. You will get over everything in this dunya. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ala Well, 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 well. Run away from everyone. Don't you think that a day will come whereby you will present yourself before us and you will have an interview with your creator? Don't you not think that you will be resurrected for a great, grievous day? When people will stand before their creator. At that moment, you have nowhere to run. There's no way you will bribe the angels. There's no way you will cut a deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's never going to happen. And you will pay. 
And that's the day that no currency will work. There's no currency in circulation. There's no nothing. Nothing, nothing. What is the currency? Hasanat and Sayyat. They will take every good deed of yours. And if it's not sufficient, they will burden you with their evil deeds. خلاص. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. On a day, on that day, a group of people will come whereby they will carry the burden of their own sins and they will carry the burden of other people's sins. So they have their own weight to carry and they will carry above their own weight the weight of others. Exactly this is what is going to happen. We have to be absolutely careful when it comes to dealing with people. Interaction with people is the most so complicated of issues, is the most complex, is the most sensitive. And we ought to be morally and spiritually and emotionally sensitive when it comes to dealing with people. You'd rather, you'd rather not have the work fully done, but make sure that you have fulfilled your end, given the pay in full. At least you have fulfilled your obligation. Your commitment is sorted out. Before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your record is clear. Let them be the ones who will be questioned before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't put yourself into that situation. I'm not speaking about you not demanding your rights. I'm not speaking about you being a coward and you just being like, you know, naive and timid and let it be. Khalas, someone can do whatever they want to be. Let them slap me, let them punch me. And I'm not speaking about that. No, 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 no. Fight for your rights. Stand up for your rights. Exactly. But when it comes to fulfilling the rights of others, give it off. Let it be. Give it off. Whatever is the agreed amount, comes and it. What are you going to lose? You're just going to lose your wealth. That's it. Nothing else. What else are you going to lose? You're going to lose your ego. That is something worth losing. That is something worth losing. Something definitely you should lose. So Rajulun is ta'jara ajiran. The Prophet said, a man who hires a serviceman, a workman, a laborer, having taken full work from him and does not pay him his wages. Does not pay him his wages. Now look, the Prophet وسلم, left the statement very general. He did not say that this is your agreement. That the, the generality of this statement indicates that when you take work from someone, give him at least something, even if he's come to work for free. Yes, there is the concept of volunteering. That's something else altogether. That is something something different altogether. We're not speaking about that. Okay, but the sin of using people, exploitation, and I think we understand the context that I'm trying to highlight here. I have four more minutes and I think we will end here and we will take question and answer. I thought we will finish also the next chapter, but looks like the commentary extended. Khalas, alhamdulillah, whatever we've covered, alhamdulillah, we will continue in our next session, inshallah. So if there's any questions for the next five minutes, we will take that. Barakallahu feekum, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Bless you all for your patience. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and benefit you and benefit us all through the knowledge that has been shared, what we have studied. These are circles of knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses such kind of circles, such kind of audiences. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala engulfs them in his mercy, engulfs them in his sakina. The angels make mention of them in the highest of heavens. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala boasts by your names, boasts your names to the angels. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to put whatever we have studied to use. Ameen. <clears throat>
And whatever clause was breached, whatever part of the contract was breached is a clear indication that there would not be payment from the employer side. Now, I want us also to be very careful about these contract issues, okay? See, most, uh, I have for a period of time worked in the corporate world and I know how it how it pans out, you know? Most at times, as the employers, we want to make the contract favor us in every way. This is not right. This is not right. We have to let the other end also benefit. In case of a loss, there should be some form of compensation. There should be some form of mechanism that will address the redress. Okay. <clears throat> there has to be mechanisms for redress. Anyhow, but if the agreement of the contract is that if this X, Y, and Z would be done by you, then there will be no payment from the side of the employer. What if it's a person like, you know, who has worked for years, like, there should be a compensation. Just give them something out of, out of goodwill, you know, give them something. But anyways, if they have, and that was an agreed upon close, and they signed it. And when they're signing this kind of contract, let them read it, give them a period of time, let them read it well, make them aware of what could be pitfalls, potential pitfalls, make them be aware of it. Give them an audience as employers, just as, as 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 managers, as whatever. Give them an audience. Let them come to you. Make your office open. Be very cordial. Let, be understanding. Remember the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, Rahimallahu rajulan samhan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on the one who is easygoing in his transactions, in his dealings, when he's issuing services, etc., etc. Let them understand. Clarify everything for them. Not for them to, for, for you to catch them. Like, you know, uh, of God, red-handed. This is what you've done, khalas. it's a breach of contract, etc., etc. But if it is agreed upon, khalas. no worries, and they understood that. <clears throat> the second question, what will I do for if I breach the promise I made when joining Madrasa? I joined and left. Oh my God, you didn't do something really good there. Huh. You had an agreement, that's, that's definitely part of what we have discussed, but you can settle it out with them. Right, and if it is not something that you can settle it out with them, then seek uh, forgiveness for them, make du'as for them. Oh Allah, forgive the people of so and so, right? For me, not fulfilling my my end of the bargain, my commitment to them, make du'as for them. But if you can go ask for forgiveness from them, and inshallah, that can be settled. How can one ask for wages that were never paid, especially if the employees have already moved on from the organization or institution? I don't know, you tell me, dear sister, how can you, one ask for wages that were never paid? So difficult. I mean, so difficult. It's That's that's a clear form of oppression. They knew that they had to pay people and they just like, you know, just vanished in thin air and no one can trace them. Allah make it easy in such kind of situation. Follow up with them however possible when you get to know them. I mean, if they've done it intentionally, it's between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a clear form of oppression. What if someone betrayed someone's trust and ignorance and realized it to, when, realized it when the opposite party had passed away, now he is repentant. He is in a penitent state. Yeah, make du'as for them. Okay, make du'as for them and hopefully that will make up for that. Right? So you seek repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as for the person who's already passed away, right? Make du'as for them. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives them. Allah has mercy on them. That inshallah will make up for their right that you breached. Inshallah. In case an employer gives half salary to the employee just because you missed work for a day, even after communicating. I mean, this has to be an agreement. It just can't be sporadic. It just can't be like, you know, in the spur of the moment, you came late and khalas, so you're going to be deducted your salary. No, there has to be an agreement. I mean, if there's a genuine, there's a genuine reason, there's a... See, it's not easy. I'm not just... The, 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 the outside world, dealing with people is not something easy. <clears throat> okay, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَوَاصُوا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصُوا بِالصَّبْرِ Encourage towards good. When you encourage people towards good, when you want to bring up a healthy society, there will be problems, there will be challenges, there will be fitness... And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala followed up that commandment with the commandment of encouraging one another upon patience. The fact that patience has been associated with that indicates that dealing with people is always, is always a precarious field. It's always very tricky. You will always have problems with people. Okay. I always try and say, always, in every situation you find yourself, 
try and be the better of both sides. You have problems, train yourself. Catch yourself in the moment. Uh, think about your dealings with people. Think about it. Um, um, reproach your soul for the uh, words that maybe you uttered and were, were hurting. And later on, when you keep on doing this, because the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ بِالْتَعَلُّمُ وَإِنَّمَا الْحِلْمُ بِالْتَحَلُّمُ Ilm comes, knowledge comes with study. Okay, it's an effort that you have to place. And hilm, forbearance comes when you practice forbearance, when you try and adapt it, when you train yourself to get it. So traits are acquired or are inherent. Some people are born with positive traits. As for many of us, we have to acquire it. We have to put in the effort. So put in the effort and like, you know, you try and correct yourself. The next time you are going to hurt someone else or you're going to do what you do wrongly, you're going to catch yourself in the moment and save yourself from that. So we have to try our best. Like, you know, I'm not speaking of a, like, uh, 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 a utopic scenario out there whereby we can just be the good guy. No, sometimes you will have to be stern. Sometimes you will have to be, uh, you, you will have to teach someone a lesson. But whenever you're doing that, do it the right way. That's my point. <clears throat> what happens when you're working with non-Muslims and they end up not keeping their promise? How do you handle that as a Muslim? When you're working with non-Muslims and they end up not keeping their promise, you have to train them. You have to teach them. You have to let them know why this is absolutely important, why this tarnishes their reputation before even uh, anyone else, and why, why it's so important to be ethical. And you might do that your entire lifetime and they might never be ethical, but you've done your job. Our job, we doing da'wah in every, the way we deal with people, that's our da'wah. You don't need to go to a person and tell them that become a Muslim. No. How you deal with them, that's your da'wah. And how good you deal with them, they can correct their mistakes and their problems. Does Ghadr include promises made by parents to their children or vice versa? Oh yes, dear sister. If you know you cannot fulfill a promise to your children, don't make it. Don't do it. <clears throat> Just in order to incentivize them, don't do it. There's a person who called a child indicating that he's got something to give him in order to the, for the child to come running. The Prophet ﷺ saw this and he said to him, do you literally have something to give the child? He said, no. He said, don't do that. That is, that is, that is basically uh, being treacherous. That is cheating. That's lying. That's being deceptive. Don't do that. <clears throat> what if the company goes bankrupt and has not paid several months of his salary? Forgive them. Allah will forgive you. What else can you do? Imam Saab, please announce that these are sessions conducted by partners will resume our physical classes from 12 September. Okay, I, maybe people are benefiting more with online classes. So inshallah, we can think about whether we just resume it online or we resume it physically. If maybe it's more convenient for people to join in online, so be it. I'm okay with that. Inshallah. Subhanakallahu bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.